Um, Jason, uh, my man, I am so thrilled to hop into this conversation. Every conversation we have is just full, like chock full of gems, like like an African mine, uh, full of gems. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and there is a word on today, but man, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Institute of Black Imagination. Thank you, my brother. It's, uh, it's always a tremendous honor to share space with you, uh, specifically in the capacity of, you know, serving the greater good, because... You know, we didn't have voice recordings of our ancestors doing what we're doing. And so if we could have been in a room 200 years ago, 100 years ago, and heard these types of raw dialogues, imagine how we would operate today. So I, I hope that this not only, you know, serves now, but we can make some impact in, you know, in eternity with what we talk about today. Brother, you are already locked in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really look at this as an oral history project, you know, I think about how these words will live 30 years from now. Um, but to begin, who would you like to dedicate today's conversation to? Oh, man, that is a great question. Um, you know, I will, I, I, I want to dedicate today's conversation to the unfulfilled aspirations of my ancestors. Like, I, I think that the fact that I'm allowed to speak openly and freely and unapologetically um, is a result of their sacrifices. So I want to dedicate it to them. All right, here we go. Ancestors, you're with us. Uh, you know, to start, I want to, I kind of want to hop in. How do you define being a superhero? Oh, wow. Um, I, I think... To accurately define a superhero, you first have to kind of get back to the origin of their pain because superheroes are born from pain. They're not born from altruistic intent. They're not starting a nonprofit. They're actually going out and giving up their own lives in service of people that they don't know and they don't meet. So it's a little bit deeper than just like, oh, hey, let's go and do a dinner and raise capital for this problem. These people are like, no, I will become the solution because I've been impacted by the problem in some, some regard. Mm. So in my definition of superhero, it's a person that catalyzes their pain into something that just nags at them and, and claws at them until they do something about it. You know, most superheroes in a modern context don't have mutant type powers. You know, they have resources that give them the ability to have impact. So, yeah, man, I think a superhero is a person that's self-sacrificial, that identifies that, you know, the, the, the challenges they face or the challenges they feel they're deployed, not employed, deployed to uniquely solve are bigger than them. So that's how I would define a superhero in today's context. You know, and thinking and even researching your your life's journey and trajectory, it almost, not even almost, it is that, right? It is the hero's journey. Um, what, what was the pain? What is the pain that has drive or has driven your becoming? Man, my, my seven-year-old self, um, you know, laying in a hospital, facing a near-death experience at such a pivotal age of seven when you are almost a year before your adult consciousness and adult memory start to take root, your personality takes root, and having your life discussed as an if, you, you kind of have this agreement with the Most High that you're not going to waste anything. You're not going to waste any opportunity. You're not going to waste time at all. That compounded by the fact, you know, I never really fit in. I'm neurodivergent. Um, I didn't think like my peers on the south side of Chicago. I didn't really look like a lot of the people because my family is, is, is ethically mixed. Um, I didn't have a lot. I had unconditional love, so I didn't have the coolest things. And so I've always felt left of center. I've always felt other, which allowed me to then relate to a lot of people because all of us at some point have felt other. And I decided at a very early age that if God allowed me to live, I wouldn't waste my time doing anything that directly benefited me but I would do everything in service of other people who felt like me. And so I fell in love with this concept of shared interest, not just shared identity and shared culture, but shared interest. And I meet so many wonderful people because I care deeply about finding these intersections that allow us to explore our identity openly and honestly in a way where we can exchange our values, not have to diminish them or replace them, but exchange them to help each other learn each other 
better. And that that's really where I started, man, was at seven, because I'm reading this comic book. For the first time, I saw this black dude that looked like me making gadgets for heroes, Lucius Fox. And I'm like, yo, why haven't I learned about this brother? Like, this man's more important than Batman. He's the dude that makes Batman Batman, but yet we didn't know about him. And I just told myself, well, I have to become him. I can't just let this live on a page. I have to become him because kids need to know that you, this is real. You don't have to just read about these fantastical beings. You can become them. And in the seven-year-old sense, you don't have a concept of reality. Like, no, you can't become a superhero. So because I had this near miss, it, it literally is hard-coded into my brain that I fundamentally believe I am becoming and will become the real-life version of Lucius Fox. Like, I just believe it. And that that's where it started, man. Um, giving myself permission to be, giving myself permission to feel, and giving myself permission to be okay with the fact that God made me in a way that is considered other by society, but considered unique and specific to how God sees me. Yeah, I I love this concept of of becoming Lucius Fox. Um, and you know what's great about being a kid is like that line between like reality and fantasy, if not blurred, does not exist. Um, you know, to become a Lucius Fox as a seven-year-old is something that is as attainable as becoming like a firefighter. Um, yep. And so through, um, you know, the life that you've led, you know, working at Jordan Brand, um, founding Chilicon Valley, um, super heroic, like how do you make space and keep space for mm -hmm. seven-year-old Jason? Mm. Um, I give myself permission to feel, you know, mm. I give myself permission to feel. I think black masculinity forces us to bias towards being providers, but not caregivers. And so the first being that mm. needs to receive care is myself. So I allow myself to feel because at seven, you don't have the ability to articulate everything, but you feel everything. You know, you feel your world, you feel different. You feel if your parents or your family has difficulty, you feel it, but you may not be able to articulate it. And in tapping into my feelings versus my intellect, it allows me to, to navigate with the level of playfulness and joy. You know, because I always say this, we know too much, but we feel too little. And it makes no sense to me. Like kids move off of intuition and instinct. It's born from an innate sense of, wanting to belong and wanting to be cared for. And the moment I get away from that seven-year-old Jason, I get away from that, those feelings of wanting to belong, those feelings of wanting to, you know, to create space for others, I start to intellectualize my existence. And then it makes me believe in this concept of adulthood, which is false. We're all grown children. There's no such mm. thing as adulthood. If you don't address your inner child and you don't come to things with a childlike wonder, you're literally <laughs> leaving on the table all of this untapped and uncapped potential that can happen from just accepting creativity as the most divine expression of love. And that's what children do. They don't see color. They don't see race. They don't see gender. They just see their friend. And it's when adults tell them who they see that they start to see it. So mm. thankfully, I, I wasn't raised to be intellectually shackled. I wasn't raised to be ideologically or cognitively shackled. And because I had a traumatic experience at seven, the emotions of that moment allowed me to leverage both of those experiences of being raised the way I was raised and having that, you know, that, that the hospital moment to just navigate, man, with the level of, like I say, a childlike certainty, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't want to lose that. Yeah. Let's, let's actually circle back to, to the superhero origin story, uh, back to the South side of Chicago and, you know, a seven year old with, a with a blood condition, septicemia, um, mm -hmm. you know, what, what was that world in the South side of Chicago? Like what time, place, what, what was the music on the radio? Like what were these inputs that surrounded this condition? Oh man. Um, we had at that time, Chicago in the eighties, was still somewhat healing from what happened in the 60s with COINTELPRO and the disruption of the Black family strategically in Chicago, the killing of Fred Hampton, 
you know, the rise of the NOI. Like, my family was involved in a lot of that. My great uncle was Malcolm X's bodyguard. My aunt and cousins were Black Panthers, and they were, they were around Fred Hampton. My family built churches and schools and were part of all of the movements in Chicago that, that looked at how do we have sovereignty as a Black race? How do we have identity as Black people? So in the 80s, we saw the, the beginning of that impact. You know, men who had came home, you know, from jail, from being incarcerated, and they didn't have jobs and opportunities because the factory shut down. A lot of women who had to raise their, their, their children on their own without having a, you know, a consistent family structure. And while you look at those conditions and you believe that it was, it, was, it was fatal and it was terrible, it actually wasn't. Because what you had when you went outside is you had a lot of brothers like, do you know who you are, Black man? Do you know where you come from, Black man? Do you know what you're supposed to be doing with your purpose, Black man? So I'm getting this in my ear walking down Stony Island. And at the same time, I'm going to Photon and Rainbow Roller Rink and Jubilation doing footwork with my friends and dancing. <laughs> you know, we used to do dancing as a form of conflict resolution. And when you tie that back to antiquity and you look at how in certain cultures that der derive from the continent, dance is such a form of like expression and warfare and cultural nuance. I didn't realize that my upbringing was the most immersive, beautiful, complicated, nuanced intersection between Black identity and Black suffering. Because even in the midst of our pain, we created beautiful things. Mm. And while we didn't have factories, we didn't have jobs, what we had was families and communities. So the 80s was very nuanced because then you saw the rise of crack, which was the second wave of <laughs> them funding, uh, you know, fueling this stuff into our community. But at the same time, you saw the rise of Oprah and Michael Jordan and Harold Washington. And, you know, you saw all these Black people overcoming the stereotypes mm -hmm. and becoming these exemplar selves that we all could aspire towards. So I didn't, I didn't grow up believing I was less than anyone. I grew up believing that I was unlimited and I could become whatever I wanted to become because I was from Chicago. Mm. If you look at how, how Chicagoans talk and how big our ideas are and how much of a personality we have, it literally is because of that era of us understanding that Black identity was beautiful. Black intellect is beautiful. Black imagination is beautiful. And it's our right to go out and express it. We didn't have to ask permission to be who we were. We were demanding it. And it's just the level of confidence, man, like to be, to see that those juxtaposed worlds of gangbangers who can dance really well. You imagine <laughs> that? Like dude, dude to shoot you or he'll, he'll out footwork you. Like it was that type of environment that was crazy. Um, man, I missed the eighties and nineties in Chicago. <laughs> um, and, and like, you know, the home life, right? Like you are a middle child um, you know, growing up with uh, your parents, like what are some of the best lessons your parents have taught you? Mm. Man, my parents met when they were 13 and 14. They integrated a high school together. They've been through everything that you could imagine as a couple. What they taught me was consistency, the importance of consistency. You know, um, Mm. Consistency leads to discipline. Like we talk about being disciplined, but you don't get to being disciplined if you don't have a consistent set of ideals and a consistent set of choices you make. And irrespective of any pressure, whether it's socioeconomically or societally, I didn't see my father and mother waver with the concept of marriage. I didn't waver with the concept and responsibility of being parents. Everything. I mean, I've seen my dad be recruited and used and then discarded in every company he's been in because my father's extremely intelligent, but he also is no nonsense. He's from the West Side, <laughs> you know, and he ex-military. And he, he, so regardless of what he went through, I, I didn't see my father quit. He went to work in Hammond, Indiana for a company that makes all the paper pulp cup holders for fast food restaurants. I won't name it, but you can research it. And the way that they would greet him is they would dress in Nazi regalia, they were dressed in Klan regalia, and they would tell him they will kill him if he keeps coming back to work. My dad was a, not only was he going to work, he showed up early. <laughs> he was that type of dude, like, you can mess around and find out. Like, I'm coming to work and I'm not afraid of you. And he did this for years. And I didn't know it until I opened his mm. briefcase one day and I saw the photo in his briefcase. And I'm thinking, my father was going to work every day with the threat of his life. And he never was late, never complained, never told us. That's consistency. And that's the biggest thing I take away from being fortunate enough to have parents that are still together and still alive that I grew up with in a sense is regardless of what life throws at them, they consistently show up for themselves and for us. 
So I don't have an off switch. I don't know how to quit. I don't know how to give up because I've never seen it. Mm. And, and how old were you when you encountered this photo? I was about nine. Mm, I, I take that back. I was eight because I had just came home from the hospital. They couldn't afford childcare for me. So my dad would take me to college with him. He, he went to Chicago State once he got out of the military. And I would use his drafting equipment because I was sitting drafting classes and math classes. He's an industrial engineer. So I'm taking college classes with my dad, not realizing it. And I went and opened a briefcase to look for his horse hair brush and his drafting tools. And I saw the photo on his briefcase. And so I was about eight. And that stuck with me for the rest of my life. Like, this man makes no excuses. I don't have the luxury of making excuses. I don't. I, I have to get after it. Wow. And, and, and who was the first person to believe in you? Myself. Like that. <laughs> Me. That's it. Nobody. Believed. In second grade, I would tell people what I wanted to do and they would laugh. And my teacher even laughed to the extent that she wrote a letter telling my parents I was broken. Because how could a kid think that he can become a superhero or design for superheroes or talk about physics and, and philosophy and science at the level I was talking about it because she couldn't believe that I was that intelligent at the same time being that economically disadvantaged. So she was like, something's wrong with him. He's broken. And I just told myself, I, I, I refuse that. I refuse. I just beat death, man. <laughs> Ain't nothing that's going to stop me now. Damn sure wasn't going to be a mediocre, averaged you know, person on the south side of Chicago. And so it was me. The first person to believe in me was me because I didn't have friends. I wasn't popular. I was you know, liking things that weren't cool. I wanted to be a black goonie. I thought that was super dope. I wanted to go on adventures. I wanted to go to space. I wanted to become an archaeologist. And I wanted to do all this stuff that at that time, the only person that I could relate to was LeVar Burton. He was the only person telling me that this was possible. Our black community laughed at intelligence for a little bit because we were told that smart wasn't good. You know, smart was bad. And I fell mm. victim to that for a little bit, but it was through reading Rainbow and just my own self-efficacy that I said, you know what? I'm going to be the first me versus being somebody else because if, if I don't love me, I can't expect anybody else to love me. So, yeah, first person to believe in me was me. Mm. You, you are your own fuel. Yeah. I talk out loud to myself all the time to the extent that my wife used to think I was on the phone with people. I was like, babe, I got to... <laughs> 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 Yeah, bro. It's why she's like, who the hell are you talking to? Two in the morning. I'm like, babe, that's me. It's it, it's not the dude from State Farm. It's not Jake. It's me. I'm talking to me, you know? And 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 what do you say? What are the, what are you, what are those conversations? I, I work out problems. I, I I disagree with myself. I challenge my assumptions. I I tell myself, is what I'm believing true? Do I have evidence of it being true? Do you know that for a fact, Jason, that that person's racist? Do you know that? Do you have evidence of that? Do you feel it? What do you, what do you, why do you believe that? Like, I don't, I don't accept my thoughts as my reality. I question it. Because I also understand the concept of intergenerational trauma and things being passed on to us without our consent. And there's a lot of trauma embedded in us. Epigenetics talks about this, that we don't give consent to, that frames how we see reality. So I purposefully reject the social contract of reality that I was given at birth, and I'm constantly trying to figure out what is my interaction with this version of existence, because my version of existence is different than yours, different than yours. But I've learned how to navigate life through other people telling me how I should see things. So I'm constantly telling myself, what do I really want to see with the eyes that God has given me versus the filters that man gives me? And that relationship with myself keeps me humble because oftentimes I disagree with everything I'm saying or thinking. And it forces me to go out and find evidence of what's really happening versus accepting that something's happening. Um, it's a healthy exercise, man. It's how I discovered stoicism. Because mm. that's really all stoicism is, is questioning yourself and questioning your ideals and questioning, does this really matter in the context of time? Because we're temporal and we all have the same outcome. We don't, no one escapes life alive. So is this really matter? Does it really matter? If it doesn't matter, then do I need to have a reaction to it? Do I need to actually hold on to it? So the, the conversations I have with myself are very complex because I know that my greatest enemy is my inner me. So that means my greatest advocate needs to also be my inner me. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm always, always wrestling with, advocacy versus you know, um, confrontation, because I think we all have that within us. Mm. You know, I love love this phrase. I'm talking with myself. I'm 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 arguing with myself. 
which, you know, gets at this existential self. And then who is talking to mm-hmm. that self? Who, who do you think is talking to yourself? I mean, you know, we all have narrators in our head. And I've, I've distilled it down to two principles, the reject and the rebel. Mm-hmm. And the reject goes through life searching for evidence of everything being confrontational and being difficult because it thrives on fighting against something. The rebel thrives on the concept of everything working in their favor, and they catalyze by the concept of fighting for something. And that's what I wrestle with. Am I fighting against or am I fighting for? When I'm fighting for something, bro, I, I don't stop. I'm relentless. I'm like Marshawn Lynch. I'm going to come over and over and yeah. I'm going to keep going. When I'm fighting against something, I feel the weight of these insurmountable problems. Like, oh, I'm fighting against oppression. I'm fighting against racism. And it's like, damn, how do I beat this big ass thing that I can't even see? And then you realize, no, I'm not fighting against that. That has no power over me. I'm a sovereign individual with the God-given ability. I'm fighting for the preservation of certain things that I believe to be true. Mm. Equality, justice, love, harmony, peace, acceptance. I'm fighting for that. I'm not fighting against this productized version of oppression that they benefit from. Because they benefit when I exhaust my energy fighting against a system that isn't real. So why fight against a system that's not real instead of fighting for what is real? And the only real thing we have is love. And the only thing we can access is now. So I fight for love right now. Everything else is just BS. (laughs) Come on, brother. Uh, You know, I've uh, I've been thinking a lot about this, particularly through the lens of design, actually. Um, And, you know, design both in the built environment um, but then also socially, right? Like these ideas, mm. these markers, these labels of of black, white, you know, um, and and asking myself, you know, how is it that we continue to not question our insistence on calling a thing a thing it's not, right? Or calling a person something that it's not. Like if you look at me now, if anyone looked at me now, they would say, oh, this is a black guy. But the thing that I'm wearing, my shirt is black. I am not black. And you know what black looks like. So why do you insist on calling me a thing that I'm not? That means that there is a screen. There is a chimera. There is something between your perceptivity and my essence that you allow, right, to come between us. But it's a ghost. It's not real. Um oh. And, you know, as you say, like, you know, I say, like, if you keep fighting against ghosts, you'll never make impact, right? And so you think and you realize that we are actually surrounded by these concepts, these ideas. And it's actually something that you've mentioned as well about, you know, labels, like how labels labels can limit. Could you double Mm -hmm. tap on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, categories are a product of man's, meaning mankind's, desire to control everything. Because it's a survival instinct. If I can't categorize it, then that means I can't understand it. And if I can't understand it, I can't control it. And so we've been hardwired to have to put a label on everything to get to reinforce this idea that we're supreme beings. We're not supreme beings, man. We're not. We're no different than the animals that are walking this planet, the trees that inhabit this planet. We're all energy. And that energy manifests in in physical form. But when we realize our energy is not greater than or less than any other energy on the planet, there is no concept of control. There is no concept of ownership. We're stewards of everything, but we're owners of nothing. So man has to accept that we cannot categorize something we cannot create. We did not create this planet. We inhabit it. You know, we do not create this you know, what we now call race, which is just a, 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 a genetic deviations that occur when people have different levels of melanin geo, geographically. We can't say that we create anything, but we're stewards of everything. So I think labels frame reality because people set their limits based on what the label tells them it should be. I don't believe I have a limit. I believe I'm unlimited. I don't believe in impossibilities. I believe in difficulties. That's it. And I feel like if you're willing to sign up for difficult things, then you can do things that the average person believes is impossible. It's just that simple. Because impossibility 
really is improbability. That's what people conflate these two concepts together, which then helps labels be reinforced. It's improbable for a black man from the south side of Chicago that's neurodivergent, that grew up with no money, to be in my position. <laughs> that's improbable. Not impossible. It's improbable. But I, I'm now showing people that, yes, the probability was low, but I still did it. So therefore, statistically, you can too. It's all math. God is a mathematician. And once you realize mathematics, you can understand how unlimited we really are in our ability. And you can realize that there are no such thing as categories. Because if the same mathematical principle that can define the shape of an acorn is the same mathematical principle that can define, define the shape of a well-designed garment, that means there's harmony and consistency and congruency through everything. So there is no category. There are no labels. It's just energy transmuted into other things. How do you confine air? You don't. I can't grab air, but I know it exists. There is no category for things that are inherent to us until man does it as a form of survival to control their environment. So like I said, man, I let go of control and I understand that I'm a steward. I'm not an owner. And I also have abandoned this pursuit of what the label placed on me as an entrepreneur or whatever, this, this addiction to ambition. And I just, I tell people, I don't move at the speed of greed, I move at the speed of grace. And whatever the grace has given me to do today, I'm going to do it. So that's, that's why I reject labels, bro. I hate it. I hate labels because it makes us not like people based on these false identities. And I'm just like, can you just, people are people. That's it. Yeah, it's it's reductive, you know. It's 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 a flattening of a multidimensional being, right? It's like I it puts it onto paper, right? To write it down, but there's so many more dimensions to the thing that you're trying to uh, attach this label to. Um, I, I want to get into, you know, the possibility of what was previously improbable but before that uh, how and when did you discover stoicism and what did that open up for you um i discovered stoicism i was about 19 years old um 20 years old and i was in the airport and i was traveling i think i was coming back from my internship at nike if i recall and I'm on a plane and I'm sitting and I struck up this conversation with this old white dude, which for me was a huge, like, big deal. Because up until that point, you know, the only interactions I had with older white men were in the in 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 justice system, to be honest with you. It was like police officers or judges or people telling me what I couldn't be. And then I had my high school coaches and art teachers who told me I could be. So it was a very weird experience. Either they poured into me or they completely abhorred me. It was always like, man, okay, what's going to happen? So I don't know how, how to interact with this dude. And we struck up this discussion. And for whatever reason, he, he just felt compelled after this our chat on the plane. He was like, you know, have you ever read this book? I'm like, what are you talking about? And I'm a big fan of when people like give you information, like, yo, it's for a reason. And he gave me um, a copy of The Emperor's Handbook by Marcus Aurelius. And I didn't know who Marcus Aurelius was. I didn't know about the five great emperors of Rome. I didn't know anything about his background. Um, and he was like, you know, the way you think, the way you talk, you're a stoic. And I'm like, what? Well, I didn't even know what that meant. So I had his book. I ignored it, didn't pick it up. And then years later, a kid that I was mentoring that was from Boston sent me that book as a gift to thank him me for like mentoring him. And I'm like, all right, I need to read, I need to really read this book. So I'm like 24 at this point, 25, working at Nike. Couldn't find the original thing dude gave me. Read the second one. And I'm like, holy crap, stoicism works. And when you put it through the lens of black spirituality, it really works. <laughs> it really works because it gives you a way to navigate the world by having a firm and honest relationship with your internal compass. Like you're not navigating based on what you think can happen. You're navigating based on what you believe you allow to happen, good and bad. You know, and in stoicism, it's like, you know what? If my team isn't isn't working out or my company's failing, what did I do to contribute to that? Not what did they do to mess up? It's always looking inward and letting go and not holding on. And there's a phrase called memento mori, which means remember you're mortal. Remember you're mortal. And if you grow up as a black person in America, you constantly remind of your mortality daily. 
which is why we overperform because we feel like we're up mm. against this imaginary shot clock. So I'm like, stoicism is the thing that freed a lot of divergent thinkers from the confines of what they believe they can do. And I, I really wish and I hope and pray that Black people start to understand that stoicism isn't a Greek thing or a Roman thing. It's a divine thing because you're looking within, you know, and you're letting go of things that you feel are valuable that really aren't valuable. In our culture, man, we don't have a lack of self-confidence. We have a lack of self-worth. So we put our worth into the things we wear and the job titles. And I'm like, that doesn't really hold any value. <laughs> you're yeah. valuable because you're here, not because you're here wearing Versace. It's because God sent you here. You're unlimited in your value. And that's what Stoicism did for me, man, is it told me I can go back to being a janitor and cleaning toilets in people's houses. I could be the CEO of a company. I still hold the same value in the eyes of God. I still have the same potential to do good that helps someone as the next man, regardless of what outside things I assign to myself to give me worth. And I broke free, man. I saw the Matrix for the first time, and I I, I stopped playing in the Matrix ever since then. Mm. Mm. I, I want to come back to because because. You know, we started this convo and and I said, you know, my main intention was just to keep up with you. Um, <laughs> you, you know, you you said on many occasions that there's nobody who is going to outwork you. Um, and let's talk about that work. Um, yeah. It started at a young age. You know, you are in the South Side of Chicago, dreams of being Lucius Fox, but had an obsession with shoes, mm -hmm. right? Shoes, like how, how, how did this come to be? And like, and what was your path to like realizing this shoe, right? And designing them. Oh man. So it started in third grade and I'll never forget it, man. This girl named Tiana, I won't say her last name, she came to class. <laughs> She was wearing these Air Jordan 4s, military blue. And I had my third grade teacher was a black woman, Miss Blackwell. She was amazing. Amazing black woman. She still owed me my guy CD. She borrowed a CD <laughs> all those years ago. And I joke about it with her to this day. Like, you still got my guy CD somewhere in your blunt. <laughs> but I'm sitting in class and Tiana comes in with the Jordans and I'm staring at the shoes. I'm like, what is that? Like, I had never seen like something that looked... It's so expressive and architectural and just like, when you saw the Jordans back then, it was like, bro, like it was like you you waited on, it was Christmas morning because you heard about the Jordan and then you saw it in person. Like it wasn't now where I can go to Instagram and see it and like, there's no delight anymore in seeing it in real life for the first time because it's all the images out there. So I'm staring at the shoes. The teacher thought, because she was wearing biking shorts that I was staring at her, <laughs> at her biking yeah. shorts. So I'm out here risking it all for these sneakers just staring I'm like, nah, I'm looking at, and she's like, whatever, like that's inappropriate. I'm like, no, I'm legit looking at the shoes. And like, I just was arguing, like, no, it's I'm looking at the shoes. And I thought to myself in that moment, like, nah, she's not gonna tell me I'm looking at her, but I'm really, and I just was so adamant to say like, no, it's the shoes. That I started to draw them. I started to try to understand how they were made. I couldn't afford them. And, you know, I would have my parents drive me around just to see them in person and hold them. And shoes for me, became my way of being accepted for two weeks. Because every Saturday when the sneaker came out, or Friday back then, it used to be Fridays and kids would skip school until we complained. And when I got in the industry, you pushed to Saturday. You were worth something when you walked down the hallway with the new Jordans. You could be the lamest person on Thursday. You got the Jordans on Friday, you the man. Like people love you and like, yo, let me see the Jays. And I, I associated, I attributed that love to what a person wore Mm. which then gave them some form of worth in that environment. Because mind you, you know, I didn't know what my mother was mixed with growing up. We we didn't know her dad. So I found out later in life on a trip that, you know, you and I were on in Israel that my grandfather was Ashkenazi Jew. I didn't know this. So I got like straight hair, my mother's fair skin. I'm, my dad is, as, as, you know, as, as black as, you know, Charlie Murphy. And I'm sitting here like, well, what, what, what do I fit in? And so sneakers became my passport. They became like my way of, fitting in in social circles that would otherwise look at me differently. And then over time, they became a, a refuge 
because I saw my friend get shot in ninth grade and there was a foot locker across the street from my high school and I would hide out in foot locker after school, you know, and wait until it was safe to go home after that. And so I sat there drawing sneakers and, you know, studying shoes because it was the only place that was like safe and neutral. Because in Chicago, when you're not in the game, they call you a neutron. My family on both sides were in gang culture, but I was a neutron. I was cool with everybody. So I'm in this neutral territory, a shoe store, as a neutral kid waiting to go home safely. And Foot Locker at that time was gracious enough to recognize that I wasn't doing anything, but just dreaming in real time. Because I was the closest I can get to Nike was sitting in a shoe store and studying Nikes. And that's when I knew, man, I, I just knew like somehow, some way, I want to make these things because I knew how it made me feel. And I wanted to give that feeling to every person that, you know, needed it at that moment. So it was a desire to to be part of something bigger, you know. And, and, and But it started in third grade with, with Tiana and those Air Jordan 4s, man. Man, when you said biker shorts, I knew exactly what time you were talking about. I was like, oh, this is <laughs> early 90s. Okay. All right. Yeah. I know where he's talking about. <laughs> but, 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 you know, I, I love this story because... I know the other side of it. Um, but what I love about it is that it started really with desire. And I think a lot of times, you know, culturally, we don't talk enough about desire. We don't talk about uh, desire as just catalytic right mm -hmm. as as just the beginning not knowing where it will lead you right and and yours was this mm -hmm. aesthetic desire that you associated with this uh kind of social desire um but just in that which something that could have seemed so frivolous um was your path you know it actually opened your path and you know and then doubling down on that it wasn't just a desire like you got to work, right? Yeah. Like you got to work. Like you are in Chicago. There are Jordans coming out. You are in the space of Jordan, right? You're in this city. Like this, this is not a mythological being. And so you're studying, um, you know, the way in which he works and you begin to imitate it like with your sketches. Could you yeah. talk a bit about like that work, like that elbow grease work? Yeah, 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 man. It's um, and you 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 trigger something in a positive way, um, because I wanna I wanna have a, a reframe our association with the word trigger because it, it is a good thing when you think about life through the lens of track and field. The trigger for me was the start of my sprinting event, so I'm like <laughs> I'm always like let's go. Um, so the concept of desire, right? What's so interesting is desire in our community. And this is just my own belief. I haven't researched this, but my response to what you're saying, because it sets up the next thing. Desire in our community, because we've been fetishized, has turned into lust. And so desire in non-melanated communities turns into passion and ambition. Our community, it turns into lust and covetousness. Like, I desire this, then I lust after it. Now I want it, and you got it. I want to take it from you. So they've because we've been fetishized in the Black community, often desire immediately leads to, to, to conflict with each other. Like, you got that man, you know what? It, but because I didn't fit in, my definition of desire became ambition. And when I got to art school and I realized that all of my peers had had parents who were designers or architects or exposed them to things, took them to these places, they felt better prepared to perform in this environment. And that's when I adopted this mindset of an athlete because I've been an athlete my entire life. Like, look, y'all may have all the shiny new equipment. You may have the nice, cleanest uniform. You may have everything that looks like you are prepared, but you don't have no work ethic. So Michael Jordan, when they talked about him not having a jump shot and him just being, you know, someone that played above the rim, my man would shoot a thousand free throws a day. So I'm like, cool, drawing his muscle memory. I'm going to do a thousand sketches a day. So I turned design into my sport. And I broke it down with a training program similar to what you would do for athletes. I needed to be cognitively sharp, needed to be physiologically prepared. I needed to have different ways to create. So if you take away my ability to sketch, then I can research. I can't research, then I can go and I can speak. I can inspire. I can't inspire, then I can go and I can do. So I, I look at it now as like mixed martial arts. I take what's efficient from every form of creativity. I discard what's useless, and then I keep what works for me. 
And that started with mm. this desire to not be labeled as a shoe designer, but to be seen as a creative. Like even on my business cards, man, I never let Nike put footwear designer. I had them put creative and they would get pissed. Like, oh, it's confusing people. Like the moment you say I'm a shoe designer, I just limited my abilities. But I'm in here designing shoes and at the same time, you know, taking accelerometers from airbags and hacking them an MP3 player and creating adaptable playlists for accelerations and decelerations my junior year in college that then became inspiring, you know, inspiration for Nike Plus. So I, I just, that desire gave me permission to pursue things that were difficult. Had it turned into lust, I only wanted I only would have had wanted to get those shoes. It would have never become, I want to create those shoes. That's what our people need to realize. They give us these fetishized versions of ourselves because they want us to consume, not create. Because if we create, that means we don't have to depend on that system that exploits us. That's it. That's the trick. The moment you lust after what they tell you you want is the moment you have now given up your sovereignty. You've now given up your freedom. You're now giving up your ability to create what you want to happen, not just accept what they're telling you will happen. But for whatever reason, I never, because I wasn't lusted after, I wasn't the cool kid. I never, <laughs> I just kept my desire and fueled ambition. Yeah, and I'm going to even expand that because I think that goes beyond race, man. Like that is the that is the process of capitalism. Like that is you owe what you just <laughs> right. actually defined was capitalism. Um right? Like how does one create how does one perennially create deficiencies? Right? Mm -hmm. How does one storytell voids um in order to get people to think that uh, an object could somehow fill it, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a dead end, right? Like you said, like you would have just ended up with the shoes, but you would have never actually filled what was what was missing or or the illusion, you know, of what yes. you thought was missing. It's so, I mean, this is the superhero's journey. It's like, definitely like, it was in you the whole time. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, it was in you the whole time. <laughs> but like, so, so you're, you, so you're like designing like thousand shoes, a day, you end up becoming like the first black design intern at Nike. You know, years later, you are then designing Jordan's, the very shoe with the very man, Jordan himself. And, you know, if anyone's interested in Jason's stories about him and Michael Jordan, just Google Jason Maiden Jordan's. <laughs> you can find that somewhere else. What I want to know is okay we you know you're this kid from the south side of chicago you have worked your ass off uh part of my french uh to get to where you are and then you are in the room with the man how does one navigate self in the presence of greatness Dang, such a great question the thing that, so this is the part about, about my journey that I'm really grateful for. You know, they always talk about a lot of successful people benefited from luck and timing. I, I fundamentally agree with that. I, I don't, I, luck, I think, is grace, you know, more than anything. Because um, you got to be prepared to act upon the opportunity and the timing, obviously. So right at the beginning of social media, I entered into this industry, the beginning of camera phones. People didn't adopt it as a behavior. They were still in between, I want to create great memories that I, I don't have evidence of, and I want to start to document everything. So I'm also living in a moment where my peers were the same age as me, coming out of high school, getting drafted to the NBA, making millions of dollars. And so here it is, the other 19, 20-year-old kids going to the league and making money. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to my version of the league, which is Nike. Mr. Jordan, you know, Mr. Larry Miller, Mr. Howard White, Mr. Gentry Humphrey, Mr. Dwayne Ellis. And I call him Mr. because I, I owe them respect. Like, I'm a 19-year-old kid walking around campus in Beaverton with my hat broke off to the left. And they just like, what's wrong with this dude? Like, bro, let me talk to you. Like, let me show you how to move. And what they did for me was they told me, A, I deserve to be there. Mm. I deserve to be there. It wasn't a surprise. They didn't, they didn't try to big dog me and say, you know, 
this young fella coming in here thinking he knows more than us. You ain't, boy, you don't know nothing. You know what I mean? They didn't do that. They all told me, you know what, Jason, you have the, you're the first black industrial designer. You're more educated than us. You have more access than us. You have more resources than us. It is your job not to squander that. And it's our job to help you learn how to use what you've been given because you're going to be the best of us in this generation because we're going to help you. So I had all these black men, very successful black men, pour into me at a, at a moment where I needed it without any agenda, without any tactic of trying to make me feel like, oh, this is Michael Jordan, kiss his butt. Like he actually, if you kiss his butt, he, he plays you. <laughs> like he don't want that. He don't want that. He don't want nobody worshiping him. He's like, nah, if you're in this room, you're on the team. So he talked to me like I'm in a huddle with him in game six. Like, I expect to put the ball in your hand and you got to shoot it. I trust you. And so it gave me this level of confidence that I deserve to be everywhere I am. Mm -hmm. It also taught me the importance of delayed gratification because I saw black men getting money in corporate America. I saw black men getting money in sports. And here mm -hmm. I am thinking like, man, I... I'm not 20 and a millionaire. I'm barely making $58,000 a year. And I had Mr. Howard White tell me, Jason, so let's say your friend gets drafted. They go and get this Porsche, this Bentley, this big house. When they're 40, what do they have to look forward to? They got everything. He's like, that's why a lot of these athletes struggle when they get older because they lose their purpose. They don't know what to do. They got everything mm. so early. He's mm. like, that's not your path. And Mr. Jordan told me the same thing. That's not your path. And so... They, they just gave me this sense of confidence, bro. Like, I wish, I mean, then even, even Derek Jeter, I have to explain, like, my relationship with Jeter was just as profound as Michael because Jeter, being the captain of the Yankees at that time, like, dog, you were the king of the world. Like, there's no bigger position in sport than captain of the Yankees at that time. But yet I saw this man stop on the street, no security, sign autographs, chop it up with everybody, treat everybody with respect. Never saw him turn up and get drunk and play himself. He just taught me how to move. Michael taught me how to think about business. Mr. Jordan is one of the best business people I ever met in my life. Like he's a better business strategist than athlete, which is crazy to say, but this man's mind, he's super analytical and can, he's phenomenal. Jeter, man, that dude is an exceptional leader. He showed me how to literally, like when Jay-Z says, let me show you how to move in a room full of vultures. Yeah, Jeter did that for me. So imagine in this impressionable age, having successful men still have the desire to make other men successful mm. without any agenda or any ego. I just feel blessed because had just been a social media era, man, I'd have been posting all this stuff that I was doing and seeing and I'd have been smelling my own cologne. I'd have been like, yeah, look at me. I'm on this plane. Yo, check me out. We at the... Nah, dog. It was me in these rooms as a kid, taking notes, drawing, playing my position, and these great men and women showing me the way and then telling me I have a responsibility to do this for other people. Mm. Yeah, actually, double tap. You, did you say how to move in a room of vultures? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? How do you move in a room of vultures? Man, don't look like lunch. <laughs> like, don't look like lunch. Don't be so desperate to put yourself on the platter to be devoured. Mm. That's it. When you're in a room full of people that are looking to the value, do not look like a meal. And what that means is don't be desperate. Go into every room asking for favor. Who am I supposed to meet? Who is the one? And I go into every room I'm in. Who is the one person I'm supposed to meet? That's it. I go in with the idea that I'm here to meet one person. The person can be serving hors d'oeuvres. The person can be the keynote speaker. I ask God for favor to meet the person I'm supposed to meet at the time I'm supposed to meet them. I don't go in networking like I got to get make the beeline to the most important person in the room. Mm. I say, who is the person that's most important in the room for me? Not who's the most important person in the room. Because when you look like lunch and everybody knows that they got this powerful person in the room, you serving yourself up to try to get attention and you hope the person looks at you so you can engage in conversation. Nah, dog. I do what Nah said. I lay back like the back. My army suit is black. Like I sit in the corner and I'm like, I'm chilling. <laughs> and then the energy gravitates towards the person who looks like I belong there, but I'm not interested in participating in the theatrics. So I'm I'm a, I'm an ambivert because I naturally am quiet. So when I go into these rooms, I'm not good at like, hey, buddy, I don't do that. Um, I work hard to have to be an extrovert. And so for me, I go into the room asking for favor. I stick to myself. I notice who notices me, and then naturally the energy aligns, and I, we gravitate, we talk, and I'm like, that's why I came. I was supposed to meet that person, or they were mm. supposed to tell me that thing. Um, and that's what I learned from Jeter, man. We'll walk into a nightclub. 
My man to go in. What's up, Derek Jeter in the building? Man, he walked right out the back door after doing that. He wasn't at a he, and everybody think he in a corner popping bottles. No, we what up, Derek Jeter? Rip, rip, rip. Out the back. We we back at his apartment playing Miss Pac-Man, talking about baseball and playoffs. And but everybody thinks he's still in the club turning up. No. This man told me, be present enough to be accepted, be absent enough to be missed. You never want to be somebody that they expect to be in the room. You want to always have people say, yo, good to see you. And that man did it. And I just, I move like him. I try my best to emulate what I saw with him. Mm. You know, I, I, I'm a, you know, I love, I love this conversation, you know, around greatness. And, you know, I think, not even I think, you obviously have spent a lot of time uh, with yourself, a lot of time with your with your thoughts, um, but you also seem to have a lot of heuristics, right? That that are what do you call them? Uh, forcing functions, right? Like uh, these these kind of barriers, these 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 objects, these moments that trigger behavior. Like, what are some of like those mantras, motivating factors that kind of ground you as you move forward mm. in life? Um, there's a couple, one from my grandmother, two actually from my grandmother. She always tells me delay doesn't mean denied, baby. Delay doesn't mean denied. And I, I believe that she would always tell me, you know, you see to the corner, but God sees around the corner. You know, um, <laughs> you know, it's not, it, nothing hits harder than like old black woman wisdom. Like it, nothing, nothing hits harder than that. I don't care what, no, if you don't have an older black woman in your life to get that wisdom, man, I suggest you find one because they say things to you that hit you in your soul. And it's like, ooh, you just, you know, when you're not living right, when a black woman look at you, like, let me talk to you, baby. And mm, my grandmother's mm. energy, she she gave me these, these principles and ethos. Then things that I, I've said to myself and my children, I, ask, I would ask my kids very early in life, are you a lion or a lamb? And I've been saying that to them since they were like two or three years old. And I'm like, which one are you, a lion or a lamb? And I would let them come to the conclusion that they're lions. And the reason I would do that is it was the concept of fear, right? Because fear is just faith in the enemy's lies. And when you know you're a lion, you don't have to fear what the lamb is doing. You know you're in this position where, hey, if I wanted to do something, I wanted to become something, I could become it without having to seek consent. Like the lamb is in a position where they're like, wait, man, they're worried about, is the lion going to attack me, going to devour me? Like, I don't know. I don't know that this is a predator. I didn't want my kids to be predators, but what I wanted them to be are people who were confident in their environment. And so that's something I say to them often. Are you a lion or a lamb? When they start to beat themselves up, like, are you a lion or a lamb? They say, I'm a lion. All right, then what would a lion do? You think a lion going to be worried about that? No, you're a lion. You know that <laughs> you're in control of your environment. Another thing I say to myself um, is you're doing the best you can. I remind mm-hmm. myself daily, you're doing the best you can. You're literally doing the best you can. And some days, if I ain't doing nothing, that's the best I can give in that moment. Like, don't beat yourself up, Jason. You didn't send a thousand emails or talk to these people. <laughs> or do, don't, you did what you can do today. You did the best you can. Um, uh, another thing that I, I, I live by um, a lot is that, you know, I don't believe in a concept of, of, of failure in a sense. Because people will, people value knowledge that they're afraid to obtain. You know, like if you go out and do something, you build something, regardless of the outcome, you've learned something that's valuable to people that don't have the courage to start. Mm-hmm. And so I remind myself, man, there's no such thing as failing, right? You, mm-hmm. <laughs> like the only time you fail is if you fail to try. So I'd rather try and fail versus fail to try is what I tell myself all the time. Um but yeah, I mean, that's it, man. Just basic principles, man. I, I, I stay in a state of perpetual locker room speech. Like, that's just, yeah, I talk you like know, this at bedtime for my kids or to <laughs> whoever. Yeah, and you also have this beautiful phrase, right? Like, you either win or you learn. Yeah. Right? There's no win or lose. You win or you learn. That's it. Um, but thinking about, like, design, you know, let's let's double tap on on design, um, cause there's so many designers listening and I'm sure they're eager to know, like, how do you view the design process and, you know, in your experience, what do you feel is always missing? Mm. Mm. Right? Like you're, so, you're and, 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 sorry. And, and to phrase that, like, you know, you, you have a very, you, you walk into these rooms with a very different experience as most people that you encounter, Right. And and it's that 
perceptivity that fills in a lot of gaps and holes, right? That many mm-hmm. people don't typically see in the design process. So how, how does that experience influence your design process? Mm. One, I understand, and I believe this, I think everybody operates from a position of their deepest pain. You know, that's how they, that's how everyone kind of sees the world because they, people want to prevent things from happening or hurting them again. So my de- design process, I call it immersive empathy, where I acknowledge I have biases. I acknowledge that I have prejudices. We all do. Like, it's, it's impossible not to have a bias as a human. It's impossible not to have a prejudice. It's when we act upon those and we use them to harm people where it becomes toxic. But we all do. It's our filters, man. We, I don't like this. I don't like that. If you say you don't like something, that's called a preference, which is a cousin of a bias or a prejudice. It's just that simple. Um, So for me, I acknowledge I have them. I also acknowledge that I am a visitor. I am not a permanent resident in a lot of the communities that I design for because I don't believe that you have to be a permanent resident to do good work on behalf of other people, but you do have to be a gracious visitor. You do have to be a gracious inhabitant. You do have to be a gracious, you know, participant and guest in this culture or this subculture or this industry that you're designing for, because we're supposed to become fast experts. That's the role of design. Like I could be doing car seats one day for babies. I could be doing wheelchairs for elderly people. I could be doing, you know, mental health programs for, 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 for veterans dealing with PTSD. And I could be designing sneakers for fashion week. We literally have a range of what people consider problems that we have to, to become experts on. So acknowledging biases is the first piece. Second, I'm not so precious with, you know, um, you know, authorship and getting credit. I co-create a lot with a lot of people. Uh, I, I co-create with the people I design for. I co-create with the people I design with. And the reason why it's important in my process to allow the consumer, quote unquote consumer, to be a part of the creative outcome is because then they have agency and then they have value that's different because they felt like it was built with them, not for them. And it feels very nuanced and they don't, you don't have to explain how it works. They just get it because you've built it authentically with their voice involved. And I'm not talking about focus groups. I mean, I'm talking about like Jane Goodall type vibes. Like you need to immerse yourself (laughs) in the environment you're creating for, even if you're uncomfortable. And you have to ask yourself, why am I uncomfortable? What is it about this that's making me uncomfortable? That's a bias. You know, it's not your norm. And I I embrace being uncomfortable. I embrace being a fish out of water. I embrace that because I get to learn like the greatest design experience I had was when I went to spend time with the Maoris in New Zealand. And that was the first time I had ever heard that I was indigenous. And I've heard a lot of things about what it meant to be black. I ain't never heard somebody say, you're indigenous too. And I'm like, you're right. I am indigenous. And then I had a different relationship with the responsibility of how I treat the planet, mm. how I care for myself, how I treat my community. Because in, in indigenous cultures, they have a different relationship with nature that wasn't accessible to foundational black Americans. Cause we think of the woods, we think of stuff that's unsafe for us. So then I'm like, I reclaimed my identity of being an indigenous person that's earth tone so I can enjoy the earth, you know? Mm. And, and it was because I asked myself, why am I uncomfortable with the outdoors? Because I was told to be uncomfortable. So that's my process, man, is I'm constantly exposing myself to areas of life where I'm a complete beginner. And I have mm-hmm. no clue what's going on. And I just fall in love with the process of unlearning. I mm-hmm. unlearn everything every time I design something. Mm. I don't learn anything. I unlearn things. Mm. And yeah, it's freedom, dude. Because I get to see pe- I get to see the world through so many different people's eyes. I feel so grateful and blessed that I'm allowed and given permission to do that. Because then I can see, oh, this is this is their pain. This is how they manifest from their pain. And this is how I do it. This, and then I have an appreciation and then you build appreciation, you build affinity and then you build true love. My whole agenda is love, dog. That's it. I don't care what community it is. We ain't got to pray to the same God. We ain't got to love the same people. We ain't got to like the same foods, but we can see the divinity in each other and I can love you as my brother and sister, regardless of what you look like, where you come from, who you love, who you vote for. So that's, that's what I'm in pursuit of is using design to find ways to give and receive love in every capacity, wherever I am. Yeah, you you know you you've mentioned 
over and over, and I'm sure people can hear, there is a faith here. There is a, a, a believer lens uh, through which you see the world. And mm-hmm. it's interesting to think about, you know, the becoming of, of, of Jason Maiden, that, you know, you, you, you know, you work at Nike, right? Uh, dream manifested. Pivot, well, I want to say pivot, expand to Stanford to get your MBA, which we could double tap on. And, you know, there's a, there's a couple of other like notches on, on that journey. And then you end up at a place called <laughs> fear of God. <laughs> what is that process like, right? To, to take this journey in life right through many through many kind of you know design and commercial spheres to end up in an environment called fear of god yeah. man I, you know it's 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 almost like uh you know like you said it's the hero's journey it's like the inevitable outcome you know um you know it, you know it, it's just it was is inevitable outcome for me to to work in, in spaces and places where the conversation of faith is happening. And, and, it, and this is just what I humbly and fun, you know, believe at this moment in my life, that the idea of what it means to quote unquote be a Christian has been radicalized to the extent that it feels like terrorism to a lot of people. It mm. feels like we're doing to others what we claim other religions and faith does to us. You look at the iconography, you look at the speech, you look at the facial expressions and photos. It's like, this don't look like love. This don't look like anything that's written in that book. I don't know what this is. So I understand that the only time people may encounter God or encounter the principles of Yeshua, his real name, is when they meet people who actually believe in it. And we don't meet a lot of people that are trying their best to live like they believe their faith. We see a lot of people who perform. We see a lot of people who keep the rituals, but the application of those principles require us to humble ourselves and to show consistent, unapologetic, non-judgmental love, accepting. And it's really hard in a culture that's so focused on the concept of self that we've, we, we, we ignore the concept of collective self. All of us are part of a grand organism. You know, we, we all are. We, we, we have a giant, you know, uh, tribe that we're part of globally if we're here at this timeline. And so the faith aspect of my life allows me to meet people, man, and accept people. And, and, and the wild part is, dude, is, is it's so funny because I have conversations with folks who are very openly like, I don't believe in God at all, but I believe in God because you believe, because I see how you treat people. Like, I believe that if God did exist, then you're the type of person who shows and acts like God exists because of how you treat people. That matters to me a lot. Because I'm like, dude, sometimes the only version of faith people experience is the faith they see in us. Mm -hmm. And so I think about that. Like, I can't walk out here and be hating on somebody because you don't look like me or you don't love who I love. I can't do that. Now I'm putting you in a category where I'm judging you. I could be judged for anything. If people saw what runs through my mind, man, I, everybody be judged. You know what I'm saying? Like, we all have things in our heads. We all do things. None of us are perfect. We're all in progress. We're all in development. And so I just I just feel like, man, I don't want to just be a hero of the word. I want to be a doer of the word. I want to embody it. I, I want people to be like, you know what? Something's different about that dude. What is it? And then when they ask me, I'll tell them. Like, it's because I just don't want to read the Bible and just feel good at the end of it. I want to become what the word says we need to become, which is unconditional, accepting people, you know, forgiving people, non-judgmental people. And I just feel like religion has weaponized faith because those are two different things. And I just I just want as many people as possible to hold on to faith and hope, whatever that looks like, whatever that looks like for you. Um, because it's needed, man, because I think about children and if kids see adults giving up, then they think, all right, well, why even try? Mm-hmm. So I'm like, nah, man, we need our children to be invigorated, to keep trying, to keep going, to keep fighting for. So that's what faith plays into my process. That's what it's like being in environments where faith is present and is part of the art direction or is part of the conversation. It gives it a, like you said, it gives it a, a different value, you know, a different application because 
you're, you're performing for an audience of one. It's like John Coltrane when he wrote A Love Supreme. He made that album for God. That wasn't for us. We just happened to benefit from being able to listen to it. But that was a love letter to God to say, thank you. Thank you for letting me be heroin addiction. Thank you for letting me get away from Miles Davis and all the stuff he was doing. <laughs> like John Coltrane was like thanking God. And I, I, I feel the same way, man, with everything I do. This is a love letter to God. This is my best attempt to say thank you for letting me and allowing me to get out of Chicago and then take what I learned in the city of Chicago to the world. Like everything I do is a thank you, a love letter to God. Mm. Now, I'm I'm going to pivot and trouble the water just a little bit. Um, (laughs) (laughs) How do you reconcile God and commerce? Um, Well, I think a lot of it is when God, when Yeshua talks about the parable of the talents, right? Mm -hmm. And how one person was afraid of the talent and they buried it. Another person went out and gave freely of it and multiplied it. Commerce is the multiplication. It's a multiplication process. I do something and it compounds and it makes things. I reconcile the act of creation and creativity, right? Creation mm-hmm. ex nihilo, mm-hmm. create from nothing, which is the foundation of God, mm-hmm. with the concept of commerce, because I do not worship the provision. I worship the provider. Mm-hmm. So I don't focus. So that's why I reconcile. Like, yes, even in antiquity, people were selling goods. They were selling food. They were, you know, they were, they were, they were, there was a fair exchange. Before there was a monetary system, there was an exchange of value through talent, barter mm-hmm. systems. Mm-hmm. 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 You know, we put monetary value on it when we started to understand that we can control. It's a control mechanism. So I don't think. It's wrong to make money. I don't think it's wrong to build businesses. I think it's wrong to worship money. I think it's wrong mm-hmm. to worship businesses. That's where the tension comes into play when we idolize things that really have no value in perpetuity or eternity. We're supposed mm-hmm. to enjoy them, but mm-hmm. we're not supposed to covet them. We're not supposed to worship them. So that's where I feel like, man, I am a very conscious you know, business owner, because it takes resources to do the work that I want to do in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, hope ain't a strategy. <laughs> it ain't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they say faith without works. Okay, I have faith. I'm going to put that faith to work. And if I have the resources, <laughs> I would deploy those resources towards the things that I want to see improve in the world. <laughs> and I'm actually going to drill in a little deeper because, <laughs> because <laughs> Jason, don't <laughs> no, but um, no. The reason, the reason being, because it's it, for me. I, the way when I when I say that, and and it could be in my phrasing, I'm actually not uh, looking at like God versus money, right? Like mm. God versus money. I'm talking about God versus commerce, meaning like the mm. mechanism of creation, uh, mm. of desire. And and the the supply chain demands of mm. what it means to bring a mid level luxury good to market yeah. under the name you know of God and actually it's it's a little it's it's a question that I I don't have an answer to but when I first encountered um, you know this label fear of God I felt that was like really bold. Um, and the clothes feel right. Like almost angelic in a way. It's like, these is like, you know, the fabrics, the colors, like the tones. Um, but also right. Me working in the fashion industry, it's also still fashion. And I understand Mm -hmm. like that mechanism of fashion and like, like that's a, that's a precipitous, um, kind of dance that one has to do, but I've also been reading a lot of Jung, uh, Carl Jung, for those who don't know <laughs> Jung, uh, and he has this this quote. I read it last week, and I cannot get it out of my head. So uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. But this is from his Philosophical Reflections, writings, nineteen oh five to nineteen sixty one, page two sixty eight, and he says. Um, we can only rise above nature if somebody else carries the weight of the earth for us. Um, and he goes on to say, what sort of philosophy would Plato have produced had he been his own house slave? 
what would the Rabbi Jesus have taught if he had to support a wife and children, if he had had to till the soil in which the bread he broke had grown and, the, and weed the vineyard in which the wine he dispensed had ripened? The dark weight of the earth must enter into the picture of the whole. And what I love about that phrase and it's actually something that I really feel you really embody, particularly with uh, your brand, Super Heroic. Um, but like in order for these heights, right, mm-hmm. even, even if it's just in thought, there is a tandem relationship to the people on the earth, mm-hmm. you know, because those goods have to be produced somewhere, right? That cotton has to come from a field that someone maybe making a livable wage yeah. is getting, right? And so that's that's actually what is imbued in that question of like, how do we yeah. reconcile God and commerce? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you said it. It's acknowledging the value of each person that contributes to the idea, you know, that contributes to the manifestation of the object. Um, mm. It's only when people are devalued because of titles and positions. Like for me, the, the way I worked and why I, I think I believe, you know, I've had the success in my industry that I've had is because whether it was a factory worker in Taiwan or China or Indonesia or whether it was a pro athlete, there's a level of adoration and excitement for me to learn how I could do a better job so that they can succeed in their roles. I sit with everybody and ask them, okay, here's the deal. This is when you show up in the process. This is when I show up in the process. If I did a better job, does it make your job easier? And like, imagine how the conversation changes when you realize that my decision making impacts your ability to do things downstream or upstream. Then you have a different relationship with accountability across the value chain, not just the supply chain. So I'm a value chain person. I think about everybody that touches my product. They have value in this process. How do I do a better job so that they can do their job at the highest level so that they can enjoy success and feel just as important to this process as I am as the person who created it? The person who puts it in a box when it gets shipped out is equally as important. And I, the reason why I feel this way is I grew up in factories. My dad worked in manufacturing. And I saw the people who made the things we loved, the General Mills. Everybody eating the cereal. Well, I knew the lady who put the cereal in the bag. And I knew mm. that she was doing that job because she had a child that wanted to go to this school and the job was just a mechanism to provide for her child. And then I realized at a very early age that everybody comes to work for a purpose and the Mm. paycheck unlocks whatever that purpose is. And it's my job to understand how they're incentivized, to understand what their challenges are, what their problems are, so I could do a better job to make sure that downstream, they're not inheriting problems that I could have prevented because they're dealing with outside external forces Mm-hmm. You know, that they're concerned with. The last thing they need to be concerned with is this crazy design kid trying to make something that can't work. <laughs> I, I, would, I would feel horrible about that. Um, so that's how I look at it, man. I look at the value chain versus mm. supply chain, which I mm. and So that's, that's where I pour my time into. Yeah, and I asked you because you're the right person to ask because I know, <laughs> like, because you lead with your heart, right? Like, you lead with your heart. And, um, and I think we as just individuals, citizens, consumers forget that there are human hands, invisible hands that touch all of the things that we enjoy, right? And even Mm -hmm. for us to sit here on this Zoom, there's somebody on the earth, right? There's somebody at the point of earth, feet on ground, like working yep. and like sweating. Yep. And, and that's something that we should be cognizant of, you know, as we move forward. But like speaking of creation and bringing things into being, um, you scaled from super athletes to children, mm-hmm. super heroic Talk to me about your project, Super Heroic. Oh, man. Um, so it was, it was a reflection of what is the best way to deploy my talents, you know, based on a personal challenge. Like my son had gotten sick around the same age. I was sick. 
And I'm at the height of my career. I'm in the room. I'm at the table. You know, I'm in the most coveted job of all the footwear, running design for Jordan. And I walked away immediately. Like, upon notification of what was happening with my child, I'm like, there's not another project that I will take on that will be more significant than me using my brain to serve my child. Mm. Like, I don't care what athlete's getting drafted, what rapper we, none of that. This is my son. This is my child, my flesh and my flesh. I want to use my entire brain to serve him. So initially it started with looking at ways to help with self-efficacy and identity. And then I discovered that it really was a business based on prevention. And it was fueled by a quote from one of my favorite my favorite people in history, simply because of the work ethic that he has, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, I used the Columbian orator when my kids were little to teach them the art of oration and how to speak. So we would read like very famous speeches and they couldn't understand the words, but I would have them underline the word, write it down, write the definition, use it in a sentence because I wanted them to build vocabulary because I feel like if you can articulate yourself, that's the first form of self-defense. You know, it's to being able to use the word to bring forth the, the outcome you want. So I've been studying how Frederick used the word to get to these outcomes. And he said a phrase, and I modified it. And I believed that my job is to build stronger children instead of fixing broken adults. And health and wellness, it's all corrective. It's not preventative. It's all, Mm. oh, you want to lose weight? Oh, you want to quit smoking? Oh, you want to lower your blood pressure? Oh, you want to lower your cholesterol? These are all corrective measures that could have been prevented with the right amount of intention when they're children. So I'm like, if I want to change the system, I want to, you know, think about these big, hairy problems with misogyny and racism and food shortages. I can't go and convince a bunch of broken adults to care, but I can dang sure engender the spirit in the child. I can get with a kid before they realize that they're not supposed to like somebody or not supposed to go to that neighborhood. And I can tell them, no, actually, you're all like little mutants like the X-Men. And we all have these things. And when we come together to fight, the, to slay the dragon or to do the thing, we all have purpose. At, like the Avengers, we all have purpose, right? And fun fact, the Avengers comes from Horus, Egyptology. All super large superhero mythology comes from <laughs> African narratives. All of it. And people can go down a path. Horus, Ho- Mata Haru, the original hero, the winged man, was called Horus the Avenger. That's where we get the Avengers. So when y'all see in all these superheroes, please understand... Stan Lee was that dude. The X-Men, Magneto, Malcolm X, right? Professor X, Martin Luther King. Like he literally used our culture and embedded it in these archetypes. So these heroes, even though they don't look like us, they, they're they talking to us. And I realized that message and I found a body of research called the Batman Effect. And coincidentally, it was called the Batman Effect, but what it found was that children who are told that they're heroes and given the label of a hero biased towards those behaviors of altruism, self-sacrifice, diligence, persistence, all the things they're saying are being stripped out of modern childhood education, grit, determination, happens in immersive, locomotive, thematic play. So if I tell a kid you're a superhero, you're on a mission, and the mission is to go and find your socks in your room, they're going to go and find all their socks, put it in the laundry basket, and crush it. If I say, Khalil, go to your room, pick your socks up, I don't want to do that. It's all about the thematic prompt, because kids need to be prompted to take action. So I figured, if I create a packaging that upon receipt and opening, it gave them an experience that they had in their mind that they didn't think was possible in the world, that's the first thing that triggers that they're going from the regular self to the exemplar self. So you open a package, and the original one was a tube, it was cylindrical. Because I wanted it to be a two-handed experience where the child held it. And just like when you pull the sword from the stone and you're chosen, I wanted them to feel like you're chosen. They open a box and it talked. It says, super heroic. Because I wanted them to know, oh, snap. As a kid, I make sound effects when I play with boxes. No adult has ever put a sound effect in a box. So I just did the thing that kids do. So they hear the sound and they're like, what is this? And they pull the shoe out. And they understand. They put the shoes on. They put their cape on then they know I'm going from my regular self to my super version. And dude, when I tell you the footage we got from kids with cerebral palsy, man, to little black kids like going to school with a cape. Man. Like that stuff matters, dude. It matters. My bad for getting emotional. 
But it matters because I saw these kids like do the impossible, bro. With a cape. All I did was put a cape on a black child, put a cape on a little girl, put a cape on a kid who had a, a disability. And they performed. They became something. Yeah, that, that, that's the work. That's the work that matters. That's the work that matters to me. Yeah, it's, it's the power of design. It's design. It's benevolent design, right? It is. It's, it's problem solving at the root versus exactly. corrective. Do you know what I mean? And, um, and you're right. It does mean something. That is the power of it. You know, you know, things you didn't mention is like, you know, there is no boy section or girl section, right? It's just colors. There's just shoes on a wall, but like the ways in which spatial design begins to enforce and then reinforce gender diversity, right? Or like that there's some difference, right? Between being a boy or a girl, like you walk into a footlocker, like that's designed, right? And that starts at a very early age and you, you know, have been in these spaces, um, you know, in, in shoe companies and design spaces and corrected it, right? Like you, you, you used that experience to undo, to solve for the things that no one was solving for you at the time. You know what I mean? And, you know, and, it, and it's wild, right? Because your first shipment was coming out and then something pretty massive happened. Yeah. A global pandemic. pandemic. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy. How did you navigate that? How are oh, you man. navigating that? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think this will help explain how I navigated it. So I'm, I'm, I'll explain what the tears are about. Because I do want to show for black men particularly, it's okay to show emotion. It's okay to cry. It's okay to feel. The tears are from a place of Supreme passion, because it used to be anger. Like, you wouldn't see me cry. You would see me get angry. I cry now because it's it's part of a healthy cleansing of, like, the expression of love that I care deeply about the work I do. So the tears are from a place of, like, I care deeply about kids. I care deeply about what they say to themselves, how they see themselves, how they're spoken to, how they're spoken with. Because, man, my industry, we don't think about that. We, we don't think about serving these little people that can't get us in the fashion week, can't get us to the party, can't get us. They can't do nothing but just hang out with us and put us up on what cartoons are relevant. They, they can't do anything for us. But I care about them. And that's what the tears are about. It's this deep, profound sense of like, it is my, it's my calling. It's my God-given purpose. It's to fight for kids. That's it. And I'm cool with that. So the reason why... I say that that helps explain that what, what, how I navigate is because I'm married to the problem I'm trying to solve, not the solution. Super Rook was a solution, not the solution. I have, I have plenty more solutions to being able to figure out how do I impact children? How do I serve children? How do I create new archetypes of success? How do I get past this notion that young girls are incapable of being leaders? All the evidence shows that girls are cognitively, physiologically, and emotionally way more mature than boys. It's only because of society saying that boys are leaders and girls are followers that we see this complete departure from leadership in middle school when the dumbest, I don't want to say dumb, but the kid who, who's, the, who's, the, who's the loudest kid in class gets the attention and he raises his hand. They're like, oh, he's a leader. No, he just believes in a social contract that he has permission to raise his hand. And the smartest person in class, the girl in the back, she quiet. And she's like, oh, they don't want to hear from me. I disagree with that. I disagree with that concept. So... Whatever it is that you do in life, when you're doing it from a place of purpose and intention, you also have to accept that you are, you're going to be disappointed because you care. You can only be disappointed when you care. You can only be hurt when you care. And so I stopped a company 
I had the chance to raise a ton of capital, had the chance to keep it going. And that would have only benefited my ego because I would have been like, look at me, look at what I did. But kids weren't going to school. Kids weren't playing outside. I knew, and I knew this because of my research and because, you know, being trained as a futurist and, and having a, a deep connection with God and just praying. And I, I saw it, I felt it. Like, this is about to be completely different. And I pivoted quickly towards the other part of my research, which was mental health. And I started to explain to people, we got to pay attention to the mental health of our children. So then it became about this concept called psychogenic death, which is the science of giving up. I'm like, we need to figure out how and when and mm. why people give up. Mm. And, and if we can do that, then we can prevent a generation of children from choosing to harm themselves because they don't believe they have any other alternative. And, we, and that's where my heart has gone and expanded the mission of Superheroic from, okay, first it was about physical play and mental play, creative play. Now it's about emotional stability, health and wellness, and the preservation of, you know, the power of childhood. Because childhood is a powerful tool, man. And so now I'm looking at the next version of Superhero, because it ain't going away. You know, superheroes always get knocked down. Like, Superman got hit with kryptonite. Batman, you know, he met his his nemesis, Mr. Freeze, and, and they get knocked down, but then they come right back. Like, yeah, I'm knocked down, but I ain't done. <laughs> I'm damn sure not done. Um, the company will come back in some form. It will. It probably won't look the way it looked before because I'm married to the problem that we need to be more preventative instead of corrective. And I want to prevent kids from, from harming themselves, from believing that the only option for difficulty is to give up because that's what they see. That's what they believe. Um, so, yeah, man, I've navigated it just by being honest. I told my investors this is what it is. I accepted that some people will shame me for it, make me feel guilty. Some people wouldn't want to talk to me anymore. Some people would want to abandon me. I accepted all of that. I accepted that I'm performing for an audience of one, and it's a lonely journey as a founder of a company. And I've also accepted that in that process, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to feel. It's okay to let yourself have a moment to accept that things did not work out the way you hoped, but then they worked out the way they needed to work out. So... Man, I just, I'm at a complete place of, I guess the best way to describe it is I'm weightless. It's like I'm floating in the ocean in the most beautiful way possible, like the Dead Sea when you float on top. Like that's how I feel right now, creatively, spiritually. I feel like not floating like I'm lost, but I'm floating knowing that I don't have to support the weight of my purpose. I don't mm. have to hold the weight of the weight of my calling. I don't have mm. to carry that weight of feeling that I need to do this thing. I just need to do the thing. Mm -hmm. And trust that provision will come. Trust that resources will come. Trust that the right opportunities will come for me to do the thing that I'm deployed to do. The moment I think that I'm employed to do it, then I take on the weight. And then mm. I try to be the, the quarterback and the receiver of my blessing. I'm just running my route, dog. God gonna throw the ball. I just gotta be ready to catch it. <laughs> Well, I, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I do have two more questions. Can you hang for maybe 10 minutes? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, slight pivot, but this, yeah. is where I want, <laughs> this is where I want to finish. You want to be mayor of Chicago. Talk to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, you know, Chicago is such a unique city, you know, with its heritage and its origin story. And I really fundamentally believe by even putting that out into the world, it gives other people, people like me, permission to try to achieve it. Mm -hmm. So I look at what's happening right now with the mayoral race in Chicago, and there's so many young black people stepping up saying, I want to be mayor. I want to be mayor. Now, I don't take credit for catalyzing that thought, but I can say I put it into every interview. I put it out there like, yo, you can think of yourself as mayor too. Mm -hmm. You can think of yourself as mayor. Why mm -hmm. not? Why not? Why not? Like, why not say I want to go home and run for mayor of my city to improve my city? I will do it, but I will do it when I'm independently wealthy because I don't want nobody's money. I don't want nobody's agenda. I don't want nobody's direction. I want to be completely independent. I will take my money and give it back to the community. I don't need a check. And I want to do it from a position of wanting to serve, not to receive. Because people take political offices to get in fringe benefits. Nah, dog, I'm cool. I want to have my own benefits separate from the city. And I want to just simply serve my city. I want to help my city, every part of my city. 
Because just as much as the North side has been tricked into believing they're better and the South side believing they're worse and the West side believing they don't exist, man, we all being played. So I'm like, I, I want to go back and create this beautiful, open world of education and knowledge because Chicago really is the epicenter of what happens when you have displaced people who are ambitious and entrepreneurial coming together through the lens of art and design. So when you look at it, you got all the Jews who came over from, you know, from Nazi Germany. They found out IIT, which became you know, the North American Bauhaus. You got all the blacks that came from the South during the Great Migration. And they brought all the customs norms, this, that, and the third. And now we got all these different genres of music and businesses and this, that, and the third. <laughs> like, you got the Irish, the Italians. Like, it's so unique how Chicago is segregated and laid out, but how the intersectionality was always at this meeting point of creativity and entrepreneurship. You can see why a lot of us are hard to employ because we want to build it. We don't want to just work for it. We want to build it. Like, that's what we're taught. That's what we've seen um, in a very small kind of clustered way. Um, so yeah, I want to be part of that, man. I want to go back to my hometown and I want to, I want to, I want to give as many kids, regardless of where they are in the city, the chance to live their dreams, man. Like that's my goal. Cause that's the only way you're going to fix the problems of Chicago is by starting with the children. Not, we got to rebuild it from the ground up. It's not, it's unfortunate, but the city as it functions today, um, it you, you can't be business as usual. It has to be redesigned. And I feel like it will have to be a creative leader that, it brings that city back to its prominence because it was founded by a creative entrepreneurial person from Haiti. You know, a brother coming up to trade and do fur business. Like this man was up there hustling. So you need a you need a hustler who's creative to come back and run the city. Yeah. I and I'm gonna actually double tap on that, but I'm gonna combine it with that last question. So first mm -hmm. of all, uh Mr. Maiden, I just want to acknowledge you acknowledge you first for just being a friend always you know from the time we met in israel years ago um to this very moment you have been nothing but full support always um you are exactly as you present um and i want to acknowledge your tremendous amount of vulner vulnerability that you also continue to show right your your full range of emotion your ability to make room for both your sadness and your joy and to use it as fuel for creativity um and acknowledge just i think the example you set for all of us all of us weird quirky geeky kids you know who didn't fit in always um but doubled down on yourself in order to achieve not the impossible but the improbable and to do it all with love always and so i want to thank you and acknowledge how you consistently like show up in the world just for, I mean, I can just do it personally, but I know that you do it for so, 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 so many people. And so I want to just thank you for that, brother. Love you. Thank you, man. I love you too, bro. Um, so my last question, and this, I think this is in combination with your um, campaign speech for mayor of Chicago, <laughs> uh, because, because, because I know you have a beautiful vision for that city. And that's what I also want to hear. But what is the world you imagine for the future? Oh, man. That's a great question. Um, I imagine a borderless world. I imagine a borderless world where everything is a chance to experience and learn from and with the people in that environment. Like... I just see life as one big giant superhero training facility. Like how do we use the things that are in our environment to improve ourselves and improve what we leave behind? And it's like, man, if we could just think about the impact of our decisions in centuries, not in seconds, mm. then it becomes a very different conversation with your your moment on this timeline. So I, 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 I would love to see a borderless world because borders, it creates division. And, you know, the reality of it is, man, we own none of this. We're stewards. We're stewards. We don't own this land. Mm. We don't own any of this. We're stewards. And you could do that through technology. 
that's what the borders erode is when you allow what we currently have with all this beautiful immersive tech to be a way to engage and experience culture. And we do it in certain ways. The culinary arts have become borderless. You know, you can get any type of food anywhere, anytime. Music has become borderless. But what hasn't become borderless, man, is access and love. Like there's still boundaries around mm. how and where and when you can feel, give and see and receive love. And that's so weird to me. Because if we can figure out how to have at the same time on DoorDash, Indian food, Mexican food, Italian food, soul food, I should be able to figure out how to go in and appreciate those same cultures. Not just what they create, but the culture itself. It comes from the history, the people, the look, the feel. Like, that's what I want to see. This borderless, borderless world, man. Because we we oftentimes reduce people down to the things they create. I don't like that. Mm. I want to really, really get to a place where we can see who people are and why they created is why we fall in love with who that culture, not what they create. Because I, I, what's wild to me is I'll see people who don't know my family is like mixed with Afro-Latino. And they'll talk about, you know, Mexicans and they'll go and go to a Mexican restaurant right after that. I'm like, you do know that the same people you hate just invented that thing that you eat. <laughs> like, how can you like that but not like that? It doesn't make sense to me. So that's what I mean by borderless, man, is... If you love the creation, love where the creation came from just as much, just as much as the creation, um, which then lines up with the vision of Chicago being this open air museum. It's open air architecture museum where anyone can learn anything about any topic. And I do believe the future of the cities that we will exist within will have to be through the lens of apprenticeship. And you have to learn by doing. You have to go back to kinesthetic learning, not these pedagogical models that focus on rote memorization and mastery of abstract concepts. There's no such thing as mastery if you can't, in perpetuity, own the concept. You only can appreciate. You only can contribute to knowledge. You cannot own or contain knowledge. So I refute how we're educating our children because they come out of school with no actual skills but a whole bunch of information. So apprenticeship and learning and exploration and embedding history in our environment allows us to understand it, appreciate it, and preserve and protect it. Not just look at it and exploit it, but protect it. If we protected our history the way we protected our homes, we wouldn't have had the problems we have because we wouldn't want to repeat it. <laughs> we wouldn't want to repeat it. We'd be like, oh, we ain't going back to that. Nah, man. We don't really have this relationship with knowledge like we think we do because we don't apply what we know. We just know it. So that's why I said apprenticeships that's the foundation of the future city. Not mastery of knowledge, but mastery of self. That's more important to me. I mean, brother, I'm voting for you. Like, I don't know. I, don't know. I, mean, I, should, I should move now. I should move now so I could get ready. Um, Jason, brother, this has been so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Have a beautiful afternoon. I love you so much. It was rare. Love you too, black man. Appreciate y'all. <laughs> Ooh, man, I met Jason back in 2019, and if this brother has taught me anything, it's that vulnerability is a superpower. We are so grateful to have this community. Your messages and emails are the fuel that keep us going. Make sure to leave us a review over on Apple Podcasts. Share some of your thoughts with us over on Instagram and Twitter, at Black Imagination. And be sure to check out this conversation and others at blackimagination.com. And you can now watch this episode on our new YouTube channel, the Institute of Black Imagination. Within each of us lie powers that only the pressures of life can reveal. It's time to be your own superhero. Stay curious and keep dreaming. <laughs>